get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of P90X, Atari, Einstein Bagels, TerraCycle, we're talking about TerraCycle a little bit, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Um, Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 hosts in-person, small group VIP events for top entrepreneurs all over the country, including many events in the e-commerce industry. Uh, Rise25 hosted events this past year in Austin, Chicago, Santa Barbara, San Diego, New York, Sonoma, Las Vegas, probably more I'm missing. Uh, (laughs) If you see yourself, and I know Matt does, uh, you know, the value of immersing yourself with other top entrepreneurs to connect and collaborate to get your business to the next level, inside or outside of your industry, uh, go to rise25.com and contact us and find out where our next event is going to be. I am excited uh, today. This has been like a long time coming, maybe like three years coming. I don't know. Today we have the co-founder of <laughs> DMAC Media and co-founder of uh, Pila Case, Matthew Bertulli. Pila Case is the world's first compostable phone case. So, you know, I didn't know this until Matt and I were talking, which there's billions of cases produced every year. Um, that's like equates to maybe 400 million pounds of plastic that will probably end up in the ocean or some dumpster or some landfill. And so it's amazing. You guys are disrupting the, the phone case uh, mm-hmm. industry. So that's really cool. We'll talk about that. And DMAC Media is an award-winning e-commerce products and services company. Over a decade, uh, they're based in Toronto and they are one of the largest Magento Gold Partners. I think you talked to them really early on. So I wanna hear that oh, story. Yeah. And one of the top, uh, not only uh, in Canada, but globally, and a Shopify partner as well. Their 90-person staff provides e-commerce platform technology and managed services, which we'll talk more about, to retailers, manufacturers, wholesale distributors, selling either direct to consumer or business to business. And the whopping, um, I mean, you guys are moving the needle in the economy. They help their clients process over $500 million per year. So, Matt, thanks for joining me. Yeah, man. Thank you. And of course, I'm drinking a glass of water while you're that's actually totally going to cool. queue me up, right? That's, <laughs> that's how it always works. <laughs> so there's so much we could talk about. And, um, <laughs> you know, I want to talk about what's going on with Pila and I want to yeah. talk about DMAC, but I wanted to start off early on because all of this kind of stems from um, a, entrepreneurship and yeah. Your family, you come from a family of entrepreneurs and oh, yeah. your grandparents, your mom. So yep. talk about what did you see? What were they doing when you were growing up? Yeah, I'm, I guess I'm technically like third generation retailer now. Mm. Um, like my grandparents owned, started and owned a bunch of different retail stores in Northern Ontario. So like I think three or four decades worth uh, that they were in business, like 40 years. Um, mostly in furniture, home decor, you know, a brief stint in baby, uh, baby gear in, I think the nineties. Um, and then my mom took those businesses over from them when my grandfather passed away. Mm. So my mother's family was always the self-employed group and my dad's side was the engineers, you know, work in the mines, uh, group. So were you working then, in retail or what were you doing as a kid? Uh, as a kid? Yeah. I kind of grew up in the back room of a retail store. Right, like we're in the warehouse. Because you were early on in e-commerce. I mean, yeah, I mean, in Canada, I was like one of the first. Uh, you know, ten years ago, like it was non-existent up here. And then, um, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I'm, I'm about 12, 13 years, like direct in e-commerce. And then, when I was nineteen, my first job was like working for a, a company that made um, like add-ons for the Sims games. And sold those online, like little like dresses and shit that you would buy for these characters. <laughs> uh, and then I, I've always been in selling like something online, right? And um, you know everything from digital goods to physical goods. But like the last 12, 13 years has all been physical stuff. Uh, like I haven't sold a digital thing in a long time. So I mentioned it in the in the intro, um, you called up and you were talking to the founder Magento's wife. What was going on? Yeah. Uh, so Addie, like 
when I started DMAC, I, I had just come out of a stint at NetSuite, and I left NetSuite right after we went public, um, which was a great company and like really fun to work for. Uh, and I didn't really know what I was going to do. I just knew I wanted to do something in retail e-com. And I want to just paint the picture. I think I remember um, at the time you are getting married, you quit yeah. your job, you yeah. don't have a job, you don't have a company. Yeah, at this point. my father-in-law was not super thrilled. <laughs> like, what uh, are you marrying into for this guy? Yeah, don't, I, the, the, the father of the bride speech was kind of awkward <laughs> in that one. It's like, you know, this kid's interesting. I think that was probably his words. What were you thinking words. at the time? I mean, obviously, you did you have a greater vision? You're like, I just don't like what I'm doing. I'm going to do something else. I just wanted to do my own thing. Yeah. You know, I was 26, 27. Um it was just ready, man, like working for a big company. I, I went to NetSuite to learn how to – how to sell. Um, you know, I was a software developer by trade and yeah. I didn't know shit about like the front end of a business, you know, marketing and sales. So I got a job at NetSuite as a pre-sale engineer. Um, just like wealth of experience in a very short period of time. And then I wanted to go and start my own thing and yeah. there was no big vision. It was just like, I want to have some fun and do my own thing. That's Are you, it. will you think being in that your family, the way you were just gave you the confidence to just like not worry about oh, it. Yeah. Were you were you not concerned at all? I mean, I, most people maybe be freaking out at that point. Like, I need something to be doing. It sounded like you just you knew you'd be fine. I don't know. Yeah. What were you I, okay. So like that's the thing too, right? Like this. I mean, this not. There's no. There's no BS here. Like, I came from a decent middle class family. Uh, you know, with a skill set that was on the rise. So my worst case scenario was like, go back. Doesn't and- work. I got to go get a job that pays extremely well. Like. Right. Like I'm not – I will never sell this story as some – Still a risk though. Struggle. I mean it's still a risk. Totally a risk, yeah. right? But like you know, I started a service business, which it's – those are those are cash generating right from day one if you do yeah. them right. So it was not a – I wasn't looking at it like this massive risk. I was looking at it like this opportunity to do something yeah. myself you and just fall back figure it out. Yeah, and I always knew that I – I mean even today, like everything could fall apart and everything could go away and – I know I'm good, right? And that, that, and that's just a confidence in oneself too. Like over time, entrepreneurs struggle with this imposter syndrome thing, and I, I definitely do. But I also know there's like a baseline level that I could probably, you know, be okay at. Um, so there's no big idea at the time. So no. what were you thinking? You were going to. Well, I was create? just thinking like the Canadian Canadian retail. So I was watching when I was at Netsuite. I most of my customers were in the U.S. and the whole e-com thing was starting to really gain traction in the U.S. market, but in Canada it was like less than one percent of all retail. And I figured there's only a matter of time before it comes north. Uh, and that's kind of like in and around that in that first year or so that I had left Netsuite and was doing some independent consulting and working with different retailers I knew on like backend systems integration, shit that I knew really well. Right, is when I I heard of Magento and kind of uh, reached out to them and started talking to this uh, woman named Addie Adam. I think Adam was her last name. Uh, but it, it turned out that it was actually Roy's wife. And she was my like first channel manager at Magento. And we got in there before really? they were a real company. Like They were still called Varian. And they had no enterprise product. And she was just like one of the best people to deal with. Uh, so I just- She's I really just running the show, right? <laughs> I, I suspect – I mean Roy is brilliant and Yoav is brilliant and Addie was just – she was so smart and so wicked to work with. Um, and I, I think like DMAC was built largely by just you know uh, right place, right time, create your own look. You know, Magento just turned into a rocket for those first five, six years, right? Um, and we were kind of it in Canada for a long time until people woke up and realized there was like there was a product here and – it was worth looking at for the right customer, right? A lot um, of runway, tons of runway, and you know, same same sort of deal with Shopify later on. Like, uh, I know uh, Harley Finkelstein is the COO of Shopify. Mm-hmm. Known him for Jesus, probably ten years. Um, and kind of when they were getting going and really starting to catch traction, and particularly with their Plus product, which is their enterprise product. Yeah. You know, he and I had been talking for years and years. We spoke at some conferences together, sat on a panel together. Um, whenever he was in Toronto from Ottawa, we would shoot the shit. And, um, you know, again, like recognize that there was a – there was probably something happening with Shopify Plus and Shopify. Um, and we jumped on there fairly early. 
um, yeah, it's <laughs> the the DMX side is like is is testament that you just you build a great team, um, be open to opportunities when they come, say no to everything else that takes you too wide or too thin, and you know it tends to work. Um, it's just like a degree of how much, right? Like some spectrum of success. What's been the evolution of of DMAC? Because oftentimes companies start off doing one thing and then end up doing, you know, obviously evolving. Um, yeah. Initially, what were you? What were the the services you were providing for? You yeah, know, it was Magento? just development. Yeah, it was just straight up like my partner and I. So my my wife, my partner and I were like the founders of the business, right? My wife was our creative director. Um, and then Dimitri and I are both software developers, and he's a particularly good one. So um, I was okay. And uh, you know, we we started off mostly with with dev, like just hardcore dev services around the platform, um, and then quickly layered in like design and user experience. Uh, and that was the business for the first six years, seven years. And then as and this the, for Magento. What are you developing? Just Magento. Yeah. Like that's it. Yeah super narrow focus for a long time. And then um, a lot of our customers started to get some traction. So the thing that I, I like if I look back, the thing that I screwed up was uh, I was a particularly good um, strategy guy. Like I, I see the field really well in e-com and in retail. Yeah. And that's just like growing up in it. I know how the industry works yeah. right to where, where stuff comes from to how it winds up the whole supply chain. Chance. The whole supply chain. And I never realized there was a lot of value in that and kind of just provided that as like part and parcel of what we did on the development side. Um, started to realize there was a lot of value in that and then, you know, evolved the business to what it is today, which is like plan, build, grow. So like we help a lot with strategy and consulting, do a lot of dev. Actually less dev now than we've ever done. Really? Because it's really, ch- the industry's changed. You know, technology's getting more commoditized. So... Yeah, like hard, people can push a button and start a yeah. site. Yeah, yeah, like the appification of e-com is definitely here. I have like my own problems with that. I call it death by a thousand apps. Um, <laughs> that was share, a question I, I have my, right here. I have favorite Shopify apps because I know you have a bunch of them. I've got tons and I got tons that I'd like to like, light on fire. Uh, but just like years of using them. And, uh, and I, I, yeah, I, yeah. So um, – I, I think what what's happening now is like the industry is evolving uh, even further. So I think there's going to be a, 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 a renewed need for um, the type of development services that we used to have, but they're changing. Instead of like a lot of building, it's a lot of integrating, and it's very consultative now. Um, as much as software companies like apps would like you to believe that everything works for everybody, it doesn't. Like I'm experiencing that now with Pila. You know, I got 200 SKUs. It's a fairly simple business, um, but I and I'm I'm good at what I do, and I can still see like a level of complexity rearing its head. That's going to require me to invest heavily in technology and, mm, really? and build, building systems just for Pila. Mm-hmm. What's uh, missing in the market? What do you need to create? Uh, I mean, uh, so the problem with a thousand apps is is none of them talk to each other. Right. And like, sure, there are BI tools that are trying to give you like some kind of aggregation point, but there's no like Zapier for Shopify apps or something like that. There, well, I mean, like they try, okay. but you know, what I want or what I would need uh, is still going to require somebody to stitch together. Like the, the point click shoot thing takes you a, a, a ways down the road. Like I think it gets you 80, 85% of the way down the road. But when you really start to scale, like I'm not talking about this zero to $1 million yet. Like anybody can do that. That it, Like that's so easy now. Uh, and I mean, you just like open up Facebook and somebody's selling you a fucking course for, for like scale your, like start your e-com business and drop ship your way to, bullshit. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think that if you're gonna go from one to 10, right? It's like a million to 10 or 10 to 20 or 30 to 40. Um, that's a whole other game. And, you know, you don't, you don't buy apps for that. You build teams and process and systems for that. And you build a brand. You don't, you don't build like a Facebook funnel or some stupid shit that somebody's telling you to do. That's that's how those companies work. Right. So I, I yeah, what gets you where you want now won't get you where you want later. 
Type uh, of thing. You know, and people say that, like, it's by the people that get you there aren't the ones that take you forward. But when you really go from like like Pila now, right? We're gonna go from a high six figure business to a high seven figure, eight figure business in twelve months. Yeah. In sales. And Very that's fast growth. That's ten times. You know, that is actually ten X. Uh, people throw that around, but that means that the business breaks every ninety days. Right? Like every time your business breaks, people process capital structure, they break. Like that's the that's what that's what happens when you double. It just breaks. So and you can't buy apps. You cannot app your way out of that. You know? Like $99 a month does not make a business go. <laughs> um, so I I do see, I mean like the landscape is changing so fast, man. Um, I like it. It's a lot of fun. At the same time, I think it's creating a lot of pain and confusion in in the market. Um, yeah. You well, know, that's- I, so the – I want to talk about the dragon of a business, meaning you're grabbing on the dragon's tail. Um, yeah. The Pila case. So I want you to talk about that, but I do want to pick up later about, okay, you start off with this magenta developing and yeah. then evolve. But but talk about you're grabbing the dragon by the tail. Yeah, I mean, Pila, Pila was born as a – so like the theory at DMAC two and a half years ago when I, when I bought half that company, when I bought half of Pila, um, was – can we become our own biggest merchant, like our own biggest customer, right? Like, am I actually good at what I do or am I full of shit? That was, that was the internal question for me. Uh, <laughs> you know, and I, I actually met Jeremy, my partner, um, or one of my two partners at Mastermind Talks in Napa. Oh, really? Probably where I met you uh, yeah. originally, right? So I met him there and he came to my round table and we were just chatting afterwards. And then about a year later, like we just got into business together and I, I believed in the, like the mission of the product. I really liked that he took like a really novel approach to a relatively commoditized product, um, or product category. And, um, so we kind of grabbed it, incubated it within DMAC, tried a bunch of stuff, rebranded it, you know, re redid the, redid the tooling for the product. So we even redesigned the product. Cause you guys manufacture it in Canada, right? Uh, for now. Yeah. Yeah. But the scale is getting so outrageous that we're going to have to move it overseas because, you know, North America, we don't make things anymore, at least not well. Um, <laughs> you know, that's that's just the sad reality of manufacturing here. Um, but, yeah, so we incubated Pila inside of DMAC for about a, a year and a half. Uh, and then it kind of broke away and, and has become this – I call it the dragon. So we're just sort of hanging on to the tail now and – and it's been doubling about every 90 days. So it's got a, it's got compound monthly growth rate trailing 12 months of 22.4%. Um, what were so the that, pain points he was experiencing and why he came to you uh, with DMA? I mean, he had a hard time. Like, so it's a great product. He just had a hard time commercializing it, right? So he was he's – Jeremy's a, 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 a brilliant farm boy from the middle of Canada, like Saskatoon, who spent seven yeah, years that. hacking – on this thing and and like he's like your true blue inventor right like he saw a problem wanted to solve it but you know the guy is an environmental consultant not a not a business builder um and like i always i, I give him so much kudos for recognizing that like he's like look i can make a product but he recognized that building the business is very different particularly today um so you know he just had there was it had a hard time finding the customer that was going to really take this thing forward, and even that like it took us a year and I would call it a year and two months to really hone in on who our customer was, like that first customer, like the one that that gets you the other thousand, right or hundred thousand. Um, once we found our girl, I uh, then I knew how to apply leverage, right, and that's kind of what's turned it into the dragon is. It's just like this ridiculous honing around who's our ideal customer, how do we reach them, what do they want to hear, now what's important to them, like what would make, what would turn a, a phone case into a like something like Tom's shoes type of thing. Tom's is one of the companies we're modeling after, yeah. So yeah. we're looking at like we want to build the next Patagonia or the next Tom's shoes that isn't. It's not in business for the sake of being in business. Like I couldn't give a shit that I'm selling phone cases, right? Uh, we we care very much about creating a future without waste, 
That's that's the mission. Phone cases just create a lot of waste. And it's a uh, we started there because Jeremy recognized that it was a product that people use for less than two years and then toss. And the when you toss it, it's plastic. It's on the planet for five hundred to two thousand years. So it's just it's what we now call like utility products or functional products. So people use them for less than five years. Um, so it's not like single waste plastic, like water bottles and straws. That's a whole other problem. Um, big one, definitely a big one, but we're, we sort of recognize, like we recognize that there's a waste stream that human beings create and people are still trying to solve that problem, the, the single use ones. And they're not even touching the, the so phone much. cases. To, yeah, there's yeah. so much. And I kind of like, I don't know about you, man, but I've been going to these like the mastermind talks and, and all these events for years. And I hear people like Richard Branson and Elon Musk, they talk about these moonshots. And I always thought like, well, those are for billionaires, right? Like you, you need to be one of these guys to take one and then kind of realize that that's actually not true. Like, and I, I wrote a thing on Medium a year or two ago, basically like entrepreneurs just need to solve better problems, right? And um, I'm sure you've read the book Blue Ocean Strategy, but like that has really inspired us with Pila with how we're going to find Blue Ocean in categories that most people, it's just a race to the bottom. Um, mm. So yeah, I, I think like a bunch of stuff is making Pila work. And we're building a, a brand to stand up there with Patagonia. Like, I, I Yvonne Schwinard to me is like one of my business heroes. Like, the guy has just done a great job building a brand. He's a crotchety old fuck sometimes. Like, and I love him for it. Like, he's just super endearing uh, for me, right? Maybe not for everybody. Um, but the brand is amazing and what they stand for. And we sort of set out and say like we they can't be alone right tom shoes can't be alone tesla can't be alone like more of us need to kind of say okay like we can't we can't build a rocket like i'm not capable of building a rocket that takes us to mars i, I know that but i can build a, a brand and a business that solves a big problem uh that still needs to be solved yeah maybe you prevent us from going having to go to mars like five years Earlier, I'd, like to, or keep, like, I'd right. like to keep that from ever happening, right. you know? So, like, let's let's keep our oceans from dying. That's <laughs> So, I mean, it makes sense, though, Matt, as far as, you know, you're grow you, you basically were doing that for other people, right? Just yes. growing their companies yep. and brands. Now you're doing it for this. And it maybe just took um, a certain mission for you to get excited enough to do totally. for yourself. Um, I was getting bored with selling. Like, I was getting bored with with just like e-commerce. I get so repetitive, tired of selling the same shit all the time. And like it just got boring. With your skill set, talk about what are some of the things you did when, you know, he this is a classic case where he invents something, you can't just put it out and everyone's going to to buy it or find it. So what do you do? And I know we talked, you have like 12 or more product launches in the next 60 days, right? So yeah. you're going to be doing this over, you've done this over and over for, for over a decade now. Yeah. So what did you do with, with Pila when he came to you? It's a great product, great mission. What do you do to blow it out of the water in a year and a half? That, that's a really yeah, quick I, amount I of time. I have a framework for this. Like, and I sort of honed it over the years, right? Like what are the components of one of these brands? It's like when you hear about a Casper or a Warby Parker and you think like it's not possible, um, I mean, take the venture capital out of it for a second. Right. They do a bunch of things in the right order, right? Like there's a sequence to which they, they do things. Um, Pila's problem was they just had never figured out who their customer was. Like, mm -hmm. And I, I think a lot of brands, what I saw over the years was brands were trying to be too many things to too many people. Mm -hmm. um, and I the first thing we did was say like, okay, let's just, let's go on Instagram and see if we can find one, like one uh, vegan right and that was the goal was like give me i want to find my vegan and by that i mean i want to find you know the joke with vegans is how do you know that they're a vegan they tell you <laughs> like when somebody introduces themselves it's like hey i'm mad i'm a vegan right right uh, so i wanted to find like our vegan and the person that would not shut up if we gave them this product 
Um, and that took a while to find. Like, who's that one customer? Like the Kevin Kelly's Thousand True Fans. Like, you just need the one narrow segment to build a, a billion dollar brand. And um, and we definitely didn't set out to build a billion dollar brand. We just said like, if we're gonna get traction with this product, we need that customer. So we started there, um, did a ton of testing yeah. on- What did you find, how did you find that person? Uh, it was Instagram and it was a yeah. lot of like, we call it the grind. Uh, the grind is, you know, I, I hired a girl named Santa. She came into DMAC is what we called our merchant in residence. So basically like, I want a entrepreneur that works right beside me that's just gonna do the grind, which is like hang out on Instagram, talking to people, posting, talking, posting, talking, just do the grind until she found a bunch that were like over the moon engaging, you know? Respond to everything, repost your stuff, like give you those signals that you need to know that like, okay, we got our vegan here. Mm. And we found those girls in what, what are called zero wasters. Right, so there's like a whole group of bloggers and influencers out there that are trying to live their white lives with mm. zero waste. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we're like, Jesus, our product is a zero waste product. Like this is, this is such a good mission. Let's let's go after that. And that's when we turned on, uh, like paid amplification. Right. So like started to really invest in the business and reaching those people. So that was, you know, and that's the whole like in. Um, for me, I've got three wheels, three dials I play with. I've got like attract and engage, convert and retain, and then defend and automate. Hmm. Those are like three Why wheels. Why defend? Because you can't advance all the time. You need to turn around and defend your flank. Hmm. And and if you're going to build a like a, a scalable e-com business, like a brand, not something that flies and buy Alibaba and like sell for a week, none of that, but like something that lasts and is profitable, you need to build team and systems and you need to have like good data management and I call that defend right mm. that's basically shoring up your flank as you advance um, growth is not grow like gr marketing is definitely where you spend most of your time but if you don't shore up like the best funnel or some other thing in the world is is just gonna kill you it's eventually gonna kill you so you know for those three dials are kind of where we play yeah. Right, and once we figured out our customer, then it was just like, how do we attract them, engage them, yeah. and then once we figured that piece out, then it was like, okay, how do we convert them? Yeah, um, I want to talk about defending for a second because, you know, it's almost like you've been building DMAC for this moment. I don't know if that that's completely true, but yeah, it's totally in a true. sense, you know, how do you allocate resources now? Now you find something. This it, now we're going, we're moving ahead. And you still have all this other stuff to manage, but you're like, this is a, starting to be a rocket ship. How do you allocate resources? Like you said, you're hiring fast. What are you hiring yeah. for? And, and how do you, I guess, how do you allocate current resources and then hiring? So it's, it's the simple answer there is like, we didn't try and complicate it. So we actually, Pila is a separate company, right? Mm -hmm. With its separate team. DMAC has a like management team. I have a president that runs that company for me. Um, he's like he's a partner in the business. Like it's DMAC is a as a machine that was built over time and yeah. it was separated. And then Pila, we we broke it off and said, like we're giving it its own headquarters, yeah. its its own team, everything. Yeah. Now the the challenge. I totally part, get that, but for, if I were you, I'd be like, mm, there's this really good staff member. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. So that happens, right? So Pila actually uh, pays DMAC fair market, right? for the services we want from DMAC. Um, so like email and paid acquisition and design and dev and things that I don't see value in having on Pila full time, mm -hmm. right? I know, like so the, the entrepreneurial, you know, speed at all cost part of me says like, put them on your team, that way you can just bother them every day. Totally. That creates no discipline and yeah. no rhythm, right? So we just, we build rhythm. And we build uh, like a cadence to the business where it's this constant improvement machine that we're going after instead of this like, holy shit, I need to launch a campaign on Wednesday where who can do it for me? And like you're just calling and screaming at people like that. I, I want to avoid. Um, it's just insanity. You know, like we have 12 product launches over the next 60 days. That would be insane if we didn't plan and have rhythm like it would just it would be nuts. You know, we've got to launch seven new devices 
over the next 60 days. Like the two Galaxy, so the Samsung S8, That's S8 just Plus, for Pila, by the way. That's just Pila. Oh, wow. Just Pila has 12 product launches. We've got, yeah, seven devices uh, and I think five um, cause partnerships and brand collaborations starting. Wow. I mean, that's it, nuts. Who do you decide, what positions do you decide to do full, to put full time at Pila? Yeah. Um, so right now, so we're making this jump from like a, a million dollar a year business to a $10 million a year business really, really quickly. And, and ultimately like much bigger than that, right? Like our monthly run rate just keeps going up and up and up. So the, the first role for, and this is, it's always personal. Like for me, I'm, I'm not a great operator, right? Um, I'm not a good systems creator. Like I'm a, I'm a good visualization, you know, see the field guy. I'm a, like very good at piecing it together, but like actually building playbooks and systems, not my strength. So um, is one of your other co-founders, because obviously you've built a big company with DMAC, so one of the other co-founders yeah, is, so we have three partners right. in Pila, and Brad, who has come on recently as a partner, his last company was a nine-figure business, and you know he's been really uh, advising and helping us with um, with how to build teams, right? That's the totally that's different the, skill set. Yep, and yeah, and he's done it at like massive scale. So uh, you know that that has been a a massive help, right? Jeremy can focus on product; I can focus on like acquisition and retention of our customers. Um, I also like I'm building out, so we're building out like operations. You know, we've got roles open in marketing, um, what we call customer advocates, so like a modern version of support, right? We have retail sales, so we're not selling Pila at any retail store right now. We will be as of this fall. Um, they're all calling. We just say no because you know we're not ready. Um, yeah, so I think it's you know to build a brand, you got to look at. This is why like, I, I really can't stand this, this message right now, which is like you build an e-commerce business on Facebook somehow. Like you, you don't. You, you can sell some stuff through Facebook, but you don't build a business. I mean that's, that's interesting because the approach, you, know, you, you find your most raving fan. And then when, we, when I asked you what, do you, what do you do when you're launching a product? Mm-hmm. And it wasn't tactics. You didn't start off with tactics on a funnel that goes from – you know, Facebook to many chat to yeah. wherever, but you started off with that one customer. So you find that raving customer, the vegan, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and then what? So you find these people, they're, they're all super engaged, super, uh, you know, yeah. interacting. Yeah. So that was, that's when you go and you, you take a tactic like a Facebook ad or for us, it was Instagram ads. Right. Um, and we just started building awareness on Instagram. So there's like a, there's just a way to scale up advertising and I, there's a lot of people better at this than I am, but I learned from them, like somebody like a Nick Guzmich, right? Um, there is a method to how do you scale up paid amplification. So that's, I think that's the difference here is we never looked at ads as purely a, a, a top of funnel thing, right? Which like, it was not meant to be a direct response channel that just, you know, spend a dollar, get X in return. It was, let's build a brand. Like let's actually – let's put valuable content out in the world. Like things – so there's two things that you got to do if you're going to build a brand, I think. One, you have to inspire and two, you have to educate. And that was – that's how we did it. So like find your vegan and then inspire and educate them. Uh, and, and ads is just is – a, is a way to amplify inspiration and education. That's it. You know, it's, it's not some funnel, many, like all those, all those tactics that people talk about are useless in a long-term plan. They're, they might be good for short windows of time. Like if you got a good product and you can play the arbitrage game for a little while, it's great. You know, you'll make a few bucks. Um, but like, I'm trying to build something that's yeah. sustained, you know, and that, that's it's the tough for, you know, it's tougher if someone doesn't have a differentiation, you know, like, Absolutely. or a mission behind what they're doing. Right. Yeah. So that's, like, and that's it too. Like. It's great for us because – and that's, that's it. I, there's different strategy for everybody. Uh, you know, I think there's like big buckets that we all fall into at different businesses. But you know, for Pila, it's, it's a great product with a great story. It's got a mission. It, it checks a lot of boxes, yeah. which that means you know, um, our marketing and our, and our amplification can be around telling that story instead of 
what's the best offer I can put in front of a target audience to try and, and you know, do juice transactions and then try and like build a back end of a funnel or something, right? I'm not knocking those business yeah. models. I just, I like for this kind of business, it, I think it would be short selling ourselves. Um, There's a balance between, you know, education and selling. Totally. And so how do you, how do you um, walk that, that rope with this brand, with inspiring education? But you still obviously in the day you want to be a sustainable company. So what do you do? How do you weave that into the, the selling yeah. piece, I guess? It's like a four to one ratio for us. You know, if, if you got four weeks on a calendar in a month, um, like – I would say all four weeks will have education and inspiration type content that we deliver to our customers. So like whether they're blog posts or Instagram images or we're sharing other stuff. Uh, and then, you know, once a month we'll do something or once every four to six weeks we'll do something that's around like campaign selling, you know, um, like we've got a, a campaign next week around Earth Day where we're going to do a, a sale on the site plus 5% of all sales is going to go to Save the Waves Coalition. Like, so we, and our selling always has some kind of, uh, charitable element to it. Hmm. Um, because that's, if you go right back to that whole idea of waste stream, you know, there's charities cleaning up the ocean, but their job is pointless if we don't fill the top of our waste stream with product that won't wind up in the ocean. Yeah. So we're trying to use the top of the waste stream, which is, you know, products like phone cases to fund the cleanup mm. uh, and hopefully that creates a nice virtuous circle for the next little while right so we'll do selling but selling with purpose yeah yeah when i talked to tom from TerraCycle, his when i asked him you know his thing was it wasn't like getting TerraCycle products he's like stop consuming things yeah, you know, that was his main that, ethos the, was like stop yeah. or consume less not stop consuming things but consume, consume less, consume less. Consume yeah. better yeah you know um i think that was I, I definitely I had this as one of those things like we really started to scale Pila when we figured out that you can you have to find your vegan but you can't behave like vegans like you remember <laughs> like so the early like my wife is vegan right and the early day vegan you go back 10 years ago they were too preachy and, and too negative in their tone and now it's changed now you know you look at the food bloggers and the vegan thing is like it's far more inspirational like food is like I'm a vegan by proxy. You know, I uh, because my wife doesn't eat meat or she fish. She still is. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm like probably more vegetarian than I am um, carnivore. So, you know, I'm. I can speak from experience in that like a long time I felt like I was being talked down to, you know, instead of inspired. Yeah. And you know, with Pila, we're like, okay, we need to find our vegan, but then we need to inspire them, and and that's. I think that yeah. means that like that changes how you do things. Yeah. I want to hear about how, okay, what does it look like now? You have 12 product launches in 60 days. What does that look like? But I do want to mention, you know, on the vegan piece, <clears throat> if that, anyone hasn't seen, I don't know if you've seen it, Matt, but JP Sears has a video. Um, oh, it's awesome. It's if awesome. meat eaters yeah. acted like vegans. So yeah. if you are interested about this whole concept. So that's that, the perfect example of what I'm talking about, which yeah. is like you can't do that. I mean, he made a parody of it, right? But like, it's funny though. Yeah, you, you can't, uh, you can't be that person. So I think, like, while Tom is right from TerraCycle, like, it would be awesome if people stopped buying so much. My my approach is, uh, I'm gonna work with human behavior, not against totally, it. Totally, totally. Right? You know, they're gonna buy a phone case. I'm gonna give them an easier swap, so they don't. So like, we're not even priced. We are priced at the same price or lower than Apple Silicon case that they sell. So we're not going out there saying like, hey, buy this eco product or it's better for you and it's twice the price. That's not the strategy, right? right? It's give them an easy swap yeah. or something they're already going to yeah. buy. Yeah. So what does the next 60 days look like for you? So you have 12 product launches. One one alone is enough work in 60 days. Now you're doing oh, 12. Man. So. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you about like I think 10 of them uh, and then there's a couple that are – like I think going to disrupt the industry even more. So I got to keep those under wrap. Okay. But um, so, I mean, it's we started out with iPhones, right? And over the next 60 days, we're covering the major Android devices. Mm. So the two Pixel 2s, the two, XL, the two and the 2XL, the Samsung S8, S8 Plus, S9, S9 Plus, Note 8, they're all coming out in the next 60 days. 
How do, and you, that, how do you decide, backing up a second, so you obviously yeah. start off with the iPhones, right? So how do you decide what the next product is and when to even, because it's it's a lot of capital too to do these product yeah. launches. Tooling is expensive, right? Like each tool is a ten to $15,000 investment. So each device. So you think like the Google Pixel, that's two of them. Yeah. That's 30 grand that you got just to buy the yeah. steel to make the cases. Right. That's not material. That's not labor. That's not. So yeah, the, the CapEx here is not, it's not insignificant. It's a, it's a calculated decision. It's not like, oh, let's just do a product launch and see what happens. You, yeah, no. You know so I mean? we, it's very, like for us now, it's very data driven, right? Now that we have the, the traffic and the demand, um, it's not hard. Like every, we can't post something on Instagram or, or YouTube or, or Facebook without a stream of comments asking us for Pixels or Samsungs. And every now and then Huawei is starting to creep its head up, right? Because um, we sell globally. We're not just Canada, US. Like we are 100 countries selling this thing. Um, will it's a you it's a take, will you take pre-sales or anything? Or So we do, yeah. Okay. Um, we'll start the S8, uh, S8 Plus, whatever they call that thing, uh, pre-order uh, in the next week or so, like right after the Earth Day campaign. And we'll, we will pre-order and pre-sell certain ones. Certain ones we just know we're going to kill it so we don't even bother. Really? Um, okay. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm, I keep interrupting you because I think of so many questions. But we'll circle back. But <laughs> That's cool, man. The, 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 um, the pre, does, is that the start of the product launch? Or is the product launch, do you consider start after you've tooled it? Is, or is the product launch considered... It's after you we tool it. Okay. Yeah. So, so talk we, about before then, like the pre-sale, because there's pre-sales going on too, right? The, well, so we don't we don't do pre-sale before we tool, right? Got so it. we we won't we want to make sure that if we're going to do a pre-order, we've already got the tool being made. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bit of a risk. It right? is, yeah. Like it's a ten to fifteen thousand dollar risk, um, but at at our size now, I'm willing to take it. You know, early on I wasn't, so I we. We waited until we had really good traction with Apple and iPhone cases before we tried to branch out, um, just that we had the capital to risk, right? So there's that, like don't be stupid and take an unnecessary risk. The other thing too is that like, uh, it's not hard to look at, at GA data and see that we're getting decent Android traffic. And right. so that's like hard data. And then there's, so what we did six months ago was we put up a Android phones coming soon page and we just monitored traffic to that page. Mm, right. Didn't promote it. Just left it on the site. It's in the menu, and and, and we've just watched that creep up. Um, and that was like a good. Yeah, if you go to the site, if you go to pilacase.com, there's an iPhone tab, and you can drop down, and then there's an Android tab, and you can drop down. And so you yeah. monitored how many people monitored are actually... traffic to that Android tab. Yeah. Since there really isn't Android, there's one S7 case. Uh, that we've offered, right? That was the first one we did just to see if we could sell it. It did. Um, and the crazy is that's two generation of phones now back. So we do really well one generation back of yeah. wherever the current phone is. And that's just because of who our vegan is. You know, they don't, they don't rush out and buy new phones all the time. Um, so, you know, know so, your customers. So anyways, so I, I wanted to backtrack because I know there's a lot that goes into before the product launch with the tooling yeah. and the thought. So yeah. Now you ha are doing the tooling. What what happens for some of these? Um, so it's basically it's milestones. So I mean, if anybody's made product before, you're you're working off of a schedule, right? So it's the tools get made over in Asia, uh, they get tested in Asia. Um, we actually have three employees. Like we have people on the ground in Hong Kong. Um, so you know we're <laughs> we have no choice but to do that now. Um, so the tools get made there. There's a delivery schedule that we're working off of before they arrive in Canada that we can start shooting product. Um, we shoot product like you make it. You shoot it through the tool. And and we have about 10 colors and three engravings. Um, so one tool will produce about 50 SKUs to sell. Why 10 colors? Why do you decide on that as opposed to uh, 20 ask, as opposed well, to five? People ask. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, 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 we had more, but we sort of slimmed it down. Like there's just this choice paradox thing, right? Like. We had so oh. we and we just we keep we continue to cut the colors that don't perform and add in new ones to see if they are better. Anything surprise you with the colors that actually people wanted? No. I mean, I would be like you like black or black. That's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so the black cases tend to be 
I mean, 85% of our customers are women under the age of 35. Uh, and if there's so a black case want? sold, it's typically for a boyfriend. Right. So right? they want, so what's most popular then? Um, like the ocean turquoise color, which okay. is like a teal. I mean, we sell to ocean lovers, so it's no surprise that that one. Actually, the most popular colors are green, the dark green. Mm. It's very like earthy, you know, hippies love it. Yeah. I love it. I'm a tree. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's a great color. Um, so yeah, like one, one tool is, you know, 30 to 50 SKUs depending on the style variations we want to do. So we have to like produce one of each at least, you know, we usually shoot 10 of each color to start so that we can get photography done, video done, um, yeah. you know, start getting asked, digital assets created for actual launch. Um, but when we start the pre-order, we don't even have photos of what it's going to look like. We just show people like, look, it's going to be offered in these colors. You can look at the other cases to get a pretty indicate. It's a freaking phone case, right? It's not, it's not going to have like autonomous driving on it. So it's not like we need to show people. Right. <laughs> Yeah. You know, um, Talk about the materials for a second. So, like, you go to the site, you could see the bestseller is green, eco-friendly, which makes yeah. sense, I guess, with the brand. But so. Yeah. Um, talk about some of the, um, material because it's got a speckled look yep. to it. Yeah. Which that's is kind of, actually that speck that you see in there is very much our calling card. Um, and that's, that is good old Canadian flax shive, which hmm. is, is the waste. So in Canada and in our prairies, we uh, grow a lot of flax and flax, we use it here for the oil from the seed. Yeah. Right. Um, but the husk, the shive that those seeds come out of is really, really strong. In Europe, they actually make linen out of it. Um, so the husk gums up farm equipment pretty badly. Wow. And in Canada, uh, like Jeremy grew up in the prairies watching farmers burn this shit. So, so they that, basically have to burn it. To they have it. to. Otherwise, it kills their equipment. So we buy up uh, flax waste, like in it, and it doesn't cost a lot. Like we buy up 50 tons of it at a time. Right, and just store it, um, and we we use the grind in the case. So we could take like a, a biopolymer, which is you know uh, made of uh, both traditional polymers and organic or or uh, plant starch, right? It's like like corn or sugar or other stuff. Um, we take that. We so you can eat these cases shot. too. You could. It's not. It's vegan <laughs> free, phthalate free. It's. I wouldn't recommend it. This. The, <laughs> we're doing a. Uh, cooking thing here in Toronto with Mastermind Talks, and everybody's joking like we should try and get somebody to eat one as part of the yeah, totally part of the. the like, show. I'm like, there's no freaking you know, way I want to be responsible for that right I don't now. Know if you've seen, um, I forgot which cleaning product it was. I think it was on Shark Tank, and the guy just sprayed it in his mouth. Like this is yeah. food grade, and yeah. have like a viral video of someone eating the phone case. We we definitely yeah we we've, we've toyed with that. Um, get a professional, a professional a professional eater. Get a professional still a eater, plastic. basically, who could digest who digest a thousand pounds of food already. Already. Oh yeah, maybe. Yeah, a maybe some eating contest person. Uh, this is that guy. He you know, he's got a YouTube channel. We gotta we gotta contact him. He'll drink like a thing of kombucha that he basically brewed himself. That looks like that's disgusting. That is that looks oh. not okay. No, he could probably yep. digest one of these phone cases. Probably. Anyways. Yeah, if you cut it up into small enough pieces, for sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it composts in like six, six months to two years in an actual, like a backyard compost, these cases will go away. Like they'll just go back to dirt. Um, mm -hmm. so it is like the materials designed for that reason, right? It's elastomer too. Like most people don't realize, but like most phone cases are hard, you know, this thing is, is flexible. Mm. So it's kind of like a, it's closer in, it is in flexible. like it's wow. tactile. To, I was uh, not picturing it. Yeah. I was not picturing yeah. it to be as flexible. Wow. Which is why it's so damn protective too. Right. Like it, it's got a, it's sort of bouncy. So it's, it's a very functional product. And I think that's another key thing for us. It's like, you can't just sell a cosmetic thing. It, it actually needs to protect the phone. Um, and Jeremy yeah. spent a while kind of honing in on this Years. formulation. Years and years and years um, of trying different formulations and different base materials. Like he knew he wanted to use flax shive, so now we're gonna, you know, we're gonna look at other uh, plant waste as well um, to to see like what else can we use, right? It's like what is the world sawdust? Like what what are we not using? And agriculture produces a lot of it because you know people eat um, a lot. 
and you know the shit that we grow is there's a ton of waste right and then and the material that comes out of that stuff is pretty useful i mean you also i mean i don't know if there's anything else on the product launch but the question about um so let me know if there's anything else we're, we're glossing over on no. that um the um, the reason you can do this, I mean, one of the b- main reasons is because you've put a team in place, you put systems in place in DMAC, because yep. if you didn't, then you would be in, oh, that, te- in that business. Totally. So talk about the systems in place and, and the decision to bring on an outside CEO, because as an entrepreneur, that mm-hmm. is, that's not an easy thing to do. No. Always. So, I mean, both DMAC and Pila run on a flavor of traction or EOS, right? So Gina Wickman's book. Yeah. Um, so, you know, all of my best ideas are somebody else's and I didn't try and come up with anything. Like we just set out and say like, let's use this template, this system, make it our own. Um, so we run, you know, your standard L10s and we have our dashboard scorecard and like our hiring prop, right people, right seats. Like the whole thing is in place at DMAC. It's constantly evolving and constantly changing. Um, and now I'm just rebuilding it for Pila, right? So the only reason Pila works and has worked well. Two things. Like one, I can I can focus on it, right? Because DMAX got a team and it's got a, it's got systems and process. Uh, and two, uh, Pila gets to cheat because if I do need help, I got 90 other employees inside of DMAC and Pila has a contract with DMAC to actually engage those employees when we need them. So you think about just think about that one thing for now, right? And like I call it cheating because I've watched for years the length of time it takes for a brand or a retailer to hire both in-house people and contractors. And it, you're talking about months on the calendar. Like a big brand will take a year to make a selection of a company like a DMAC. I take one day. Like one day to say, here's my brief. This is what I want done. I know the team can do it because I own the team. Right. Uh, and I skip months of selection process and bullshit that most brands spend way too much time and money on. Right. And I'm I like it's just a uh, I've, I'm grateful for all of the crap that I've watched not work in 10 years. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's interesting. It's. it's not just not working, but it's also breaking because it is working in a totally. sense. Um, what has you had to fix in Pila because it's grown so quickly? It's like Ops. every 90 days things yeah. break. So what are some of the stages that you had to, the main things you had to kind of go in and, and fix? I mean the main one is supply chain and operations. Like just not enough customer support people, didn't hire them fast enough, didn't anticipate order volume. Like – this is the first brand I've been involved with where January of 2018 doubled our sales from December and December is the holiday season. Right. Right. Like in one month we doubled. Um, and it's just striking at the right time. Like we just hit the market really hard in a couple – with a couple um, pieces of content and media that we got and it just blew up. So that means that we weren't prepared for the order influx to be double what it was the month before. Um and it's not like you get to turn the spigot off, right? People are buying. And right. like we can we can turn off products that we don't have inventory on, which we did. But then it's just how fast can you pack them and ship them out the door? And we didn't have um, the fulfillment setup we do now. Like now we have inventory at three warehouses globally, right? So we have Amazon FBA US, FBA UK, and FBA Australia starting. Um, and then we have Canada. So we're covering a good – uh, swath of geography because we sell globally. Um, but what that also means now is I got a technology problem and that when orders come in, I need to route them to the right warehouse based on where they need to be shipped. So we're building that currently. That launches that system launches at the end of May to get ready for the this holiday season. Like I'm, we're, people in fashion or apparel, they buy product 12 months out. I build systems 12 months out. Right. Like. It's like you don't, you can't do one without the other. So, do you also fulfill on some of it yourselves, or do you use yeah. outside warehouses? Yeah, no, we have like this little mini warehouse set up in the DMAC office. Uh, we keep about you know four or five thousand units of stock at that little mini warehouse. Now, the nice thing is they're small items, so they don't take up a huge amount of space. Um, and that we have a person who just fulfills orders out of the DMAC office. 
Um, and that's about, I would say, 20 to 30% of the order volume comes out of there right now. But that's moving to other third party warehouses over yeah. the next six months. Yeah. yeah. You need yeah. to manage something else like a hole in the head. I mean, that's. Yeah, right? Like that, <laughs> you don't need a, <laughs> a full fulfillment center. Uh, no, I don't want to have full fulfillment. No, so we're building, like, we're focusing more on high touch customer service. And because inspiration, education, people have a lot of questions and they. Uh, they engage with us on Facebook Messenger a lot, <laughs> um, so we just need more staff there. So, what about apps that you like for Pila? Yeah, uh, I got a I got a bunch. Do you want me to just rhyme off my tech yeah, stack? Yeah, yeah, just yeah. Okay, so give me one second here. So, like, yeah. I mean, we run on Shopify Plus. Yeah. Right. That's the that's the core ecom platform, and it's. It's awesome for what we're doing right now. I got some problems with it, but that's not unsolvable problems. It's just, it wasn't built for the things that we want to do. Yeah. So we're going to have to build some stuff to make it better. Now, um, our tech stack right now, so we use Clavio for email, which is great. Yachtpo for product reviews, site reviews, and also Instagram UGC, so shoppable Instagram. Um, we use Smile.io for a referral program, VIP program. It's really cool stuff. It's built here in Canada. Um, Everything good is built in Canada. Come on, Shopify. I mean, Shopify is originated in Canada, right? Yeah, Ottawa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, you know, we use uh, Grow.com for a, a BI tool. We use Glue.io for like a little mini CRM segmentation tool. Um, another Canadian company called ChatKit which is our uh, Facebook Messenger AI chatbot mm. um, that's interruptible by our, our service team. So when the chatbot gets tripped up, service picks up and has an actual human conversation with people. It's a really slick piece of software. Um, love ChatKit. Um, there's a, a demand planning tool that I think is uh, is just awesome called Inventory Planner, which is actually a Shopify app, but it's – I'll tell you, coming out of the ERP world and watching how much money people spend on demand planning, and there's a hundred dollar piece of software called Inventory Planner that does like ninety percent of what you. <laughs> it, that's one of those examples where I'm like, holy shit, this is awesome. Uh, <laughs> you know, Zendesk for support, OrderBot is our order management system that we're implementing right now. Um, Jesus, man. That's amazing. <laughs> there's this death, is death by, by apps. Death. Yeah, that's right. Fun. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's uh. That should be your new your e-commerce book. You know, have a I, book. I got. Yeah, I have one. I put put out last year. Yeah. yeah. So, tar, what's the what's the title so people can check it out? Uh, it's called Anything Anywhere. Right. Your you next one, on. version two, is gonna be Death by a Thousand Apps. That's Death by a Thousand Apps. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I kind of want to. I I feel like. I should have asked you if I could swear on this sh on your show, but I I definitely already have. So it's too late. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm Canadian, man. I swear like a trucker. Um, yeah, I think the next book is going to be, you know, like is an evolution on that. It's like how to apply it and watch it rocket with Pila, right? But I wanted to call – people always ask like why is Pila so success, successful? And I'm like, it's yeah, our strategy is simple. It's called be a fucking human. Um, you know, it's, it's a crazy solving, concept. Solving a problem and having a mission behind it that people can get behind. I mean yeah, totally. is, is one of the things. But um, – yeah, big tech stack there. Um, uh, yeah, and growing. And I'm and you know the crazy thing is is I'm trying to keep it from growing, and I still have you know 25 plus pieces of software that run this business, and that's not even counting Google Apps and all that other shit that we just use administratively. That's just the the software side, like the actual selling and service side. Yeah. Um, I want to hear about your favorite DMAC case study. So obviously you've applied yeah. what you do. To your to Pila, yeah. um, what is DMAT uh, your favorite DMAT case study look like? Oh man, like customer. I mean, so, I'm sure so you have a lot of. Ones. I guess more less early on, and we started off this conversation with the evolution of DMAC, and it kind of went from developing Magento. So take me quickly through that developing Magento to then Shopify, what, Shopify, and then like we have another platform called Work Area, which is like. Uh, far more upmarket enterprise um, platform. That's so. Work area is the tool that we use when we have a brand that has a really strong content uh, component, right? It's so like content and commerce. Yeah. Uh, work area's platform is like Shopify on steroids. Um, 
super niche, uh, but it's it's pretty wicked. So I think like the one that stands out for me recently would be Lonely Planet, right? Um, Lonely Planet needed to relaunch their like their store. So like they're a pretty big, you know, global brand. Um, and the, their shop, so like shop.lonelyplanet.com is something that we've recently relaunched and rebuilt on work area. And, uh, the team at Lonely Planet, like this guy, Mike, that runs it is just awesome. Um, like awesome to deal with, like my team loves them and, uh, you know, they've, they got a cool product. Like so we'd never done anything in books or publishing. Uh, but this site, like Lonely Planet has millions of SKUs, right? Wow. Really? Like it's it's big. It's like an Amazon in terms of publishing. Like it's just got a lot of SKUs because they don't just sell books. They also sell like chapters from books and, and um, sections and like they cut them up. So it's – and they have digital products and physical products. Like it's a big, big shop. Um, wow. And it's just – you know, the DMAC team did that and it's uh, it looks good. It works great. Their results so far have been awesome. Because um, you do more than just development though. I mean so people yeah, – like at what point did you branch like, out from just doing the Magento development, Shopify development to yeah, you we're run into like design and UX now? Um, so it's like a lot around conversion and conversion optimization mm-hmm. and like user journey. Do a lot of like, and it's sort of that was the thing. Realize like these these companies don't take time to understand who they're selling on their site. Like who are their customers? Yeah, you know. So we do a lot of persona development, um, and then design UX is built on persona development. Once the site's launched, we actually have a really good um, team in place on the acquisition side. So particularly Google Google's network. So like yeah. YouTube, GDN, mm-hmm. um, you know, um, like paid Shopify YouTube. Ads, or, yeah, paid. Mm. Yeah, all paid. Um, and then a good email practice, so like a pretty decent retention practice. And, and Apila uses both of those teams to run, the, you know, the majority of our marketing from a tactical standpoint. Like all of our paid and all of our email, the DMAC team helps out with like segmentation and, and which flows should you build. Like, what's your welcome series look like post purchase? Like all that shit, they do that. Um, yeah, that's inter- You know, there's a video you have kind of breaking down these different. Um, pieces, right? And you kind of break it into paid and then not paid and then yep. email and then even with email, you break it down to, okay, well, they email, is there a cart, you know, from the cart abandonment side, you've, you've broken yeah, down each, each piece yeah. of, of that. Right? Yeah, you kind of have to like, that's, that's sort of the, the book was about like road mapping everything, right? And I, I'm not a big like business plan guy, but I am a big, I need to see everything in a nice monthly calendar to know, you know, to know where I need to invest, number one, and and to know how to create leverage, right, number two. And that's why like when people talk about email marketing, I'm like, okay, no, you're going to have to go a little deeper than that because there's a lot of stuff you can do with email, right? Like there's there's flows, there's journeys, like journeys and flows, there's transaction emails, there's campaigns, you know, then you then you got to talk about segmentation. So like, who's getting which email? List maintenance. There's so much just in email. In most most brands, ninety percent of it is like they're just not doing it, and that's a that's a meat muscle problem. They just don't have the, the human right. cap to do it. Um, yeah, I had a I, I met I was sitting with somebody from Nike Digital in Europe, but a year or two ago. And he was complaining about not having the staff required to run proper email campaigns. And like, and, and his response is his comment was like, "And I'm Nike." He's like, "What's everybody else doing?" <laughs> right? <laughs> like, he's like, "I can't even get uh, women's shoes in front of women." <laughs> like, that's he's like, "That's my challenge," you know? <laughs> like AI, fuck AI. Like, how about we just send some send the right content to the right person? <laughs> that's pretty crazy. Yeah, man. It's this is how common. is that possible though? Like when you sit in front of him, like how does know. how does he not have the resources to do it? Uh, I think it's are they it, are they not doing it right? I think it's part of that is not doing it right. Part of it is just like you know as this What's is a your really recommendation. Young, I think this is just a really young industry, and I think that there's very few people who are truly experts in it. You know, you like it's it's less than twenty years old. You know, like how much did you know at twenty years old? Like I was dumb as shit. <laughs> Like inexperience, like thought I knew everything, but I didn't. And I feel like e-commerce right now is that kid that thinks they know everything. And you see it in the ads of people selling courses and stuff. Like 
we think we know everything, and I don't think we've even started to play the game properly. Um, you know, I think global conversion rate's a great indication of just how bad we are at selling stuff online. Like the average site's like what three percent? That's terrible, <laughs> right? And and a and a store, however, like a physical store, converts visitors way better than a, an online shop. And there's a bunch of reasons for that, but I I think it comes down to people, and I think that largely we we don't have the right teams in place, and we're not organized correctly to build these kinds of businesses. Um, like I give you a good example, like for Pila, right? Instead of hiring a a uh, like a marketing team we're building a community team. So like is our this team is going to use marketing tools, but their job is to build community. Like that's your goal. Your goal isn't to acquire customers or retain them. It's just build the platform, build mm-hmm. community. Um and brand, most brands don't do that. Like Nike actually I think does a great job of it. I think this guy was just being a little facetious and bitching a bit to be to be honest. Um because they, as a brand, they're amazing, right? But I have seen, I saw recently, I think it was in Fortune, that Tom's Shoes was a more recognizable brand amongst millennials than Nike was. Really? Yeah, so Nike that spends- That does surprise three, me. Three, my Nike spends $3 billion a year, I believe was the number, on ads, and Tom's Shoes doesn't do $700 million in sales. And they're more recognizable, and Tom's built a community, mm-hmm. right? They didn't, they didn't build a brand, and they didn't set out to acquire customers. They, it was like what my buddy Bobby Glazer's like movement over moment, right? Tom's built a movement, and I think that brands have moments. And, I mean, you are big on, and I will we'll give a shout out to Jason Gaynor, obviously, for what he's created. The Mastermind Talks, and I think oh, his, sure. his, his, his podcast or is called Community Made, you know, yeah. right? Yeah, man. He so, nailed it, uh, right? Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, he nails it at a at this like, for what he does, I think he nails it at the perfect scale, which is like he's got, what, 200, 250 alumni in the MMT community, and that's it's a great size. Runs one event, 150 people. Like it's just it's a really great model. And, you know, I think we're looking at it and saying, okay, so like, can you take this community thing and, and scale it like globally, you know? Um, Facebook's Connect the World meets Jason Gaynard. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> like, something like that. Um, you know, for I don't want to discount too. Like you are very methodical about metri- oh, yeah. uh, me- metrics, and even in one of the, the talks I saw, what I loved of what you talked about is you have like an automation set in place. So, for instance, like if it, a certain metric gets below a certain amount, you'll get oh, you, you'll, email you'll get an email. So, talk about oh, yeah. what what. When, at what threshold do you get email notifications for some of these metrics? What are you measuring? So the, the reason I do that is because there are certain metrics that in the e-com and retail world people get obsessive over. It's so like the big one being conversion rate. I, I, I mean, I think it's one of DMAG's best lead sources is people like, hey, can you help me improve my conversion rate? I'm like, yeah, sure, but like we're going to have to unpack it because it's, it's not one number. Um, but I think, so what I do there is like if the site falls below, so if PILA falls below 3.8%, so total conversion rate, right, in a given day I get a notification. Otherwise I don't look at it ever, which blows people away. They're like, and, and the crazy thing is, is like we do a lot of optimization work. But as I like, what's the site converting at, this big thing that a lot of marketers like to talk about, I never look at it unless it hits a hits a, a threshold, right? Then I know something broke. Yeah. I, it's I just, just an indicator that something it's, broke. It's a leading indicator and yeah. it shouldn't be used as a lagging indicator. And I think most people use it as a lagging indicator and they get obsessive over it. Um, you know, I, I, we look at email, daily email acquisitions. So like if it falls below a certain number, um, I'll, I'll get a, I have like a little alert system set up. And there's lots of ways to do these. Like, um, like we use grow.com, which is just like a nice, it's like a Domo type tool, right? So it's like a BI tool. You can just pump data into it. Yep. So I pump all the data into that. I look at it and I take a quick glance and if nothing is below and I don't, I don't do anything with it. Like that's, you know, and then there are certain things that we look at frequently. I, there's very few numbers that I would recommend people look at daily, right? Um, in terms of, you know, if you want to be systematic and methodical in your approach to building a company, uh, looking at your numbers daily can probably, yeah. it's more likely to drive you insane than it is to help yeah. you make better decisions. Yeah. 
talk about some of those leading indicators. So, because like you said, a lot of people are using them as lagging, not leading. Yeah. So you mentioned conversion, email yep, acquisition. What else do you? Uh, we look at how many reviews we get on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. So that is a, for us, we figured out that's a great leading indicator um, to how well we're gonna do a month from now. Mm. Um, because the more reviews we get, and obviously they gotta be good ones, the more reviews we get, the higher chance our word of mouth is. So uh, reviews are a good leading indicator for organic and direct traffic 30 days out. Mm. I can't directly tie them together, but I can look at them, you know. It's a good my, indicator, yeah. Using my human brain and look at both sets of numbers, and I can see that, like, the more we get, the more our traffic goes up. So let's just keep pushing reviews, um, word of mouth. And that's big in across all different channels, arenas. Is there a certain methodology used to encourage reviews? Yeah, I mean, Yachtpo is, is the tool we use. Honestly, like the methodology is ask. Yeah. Like crazy how many people don't ask for reviews and or, and don't do don't have a system for it or right. like a process or like an incentive plan or anything, you know? Like and I think that the reviews industry and what people talk about when it comes to like product reviews or brand reviews is is lift on site, so conversion. Just bang on. It absolutely affects conversion. Not going to deny that. Um, but the thing that we've discovered and is and that we really focus on is is more reviews is equal to more traffic 30 days out. And that is unequivocal. Like it, it is just it works and it works well. So we push hard there. Um, and then the other one we track, which is more like very manual and, and human intensive, is how many uh, user generated photos do we get on Instagram? Wow. And that's a great leading indicator for how we're doing with delivery. Um, so like the fast product gets out there the, and the community, like are we building community and are people raving about us and talking about us and are they pushing the movement forward? And that's a good uh, indicator that it's moving forward. It's crazy. None of this shit is sales, right? Or like it, it, sales is a lagging indicator. So like it right. doesn't inform me about what's going to happen in the future. Just That's what, what people happened. are looking at, though. No, they're yeah. obsessing over it. And What's the biggest mistake people are looking at as far as their metrics? That oh, conversion, man. Like people obsess over site-wide conversion rate instead of like unpacking it into repeat visitors, new visitors by channel. Um, and I think the biggest mistake everybody makes right now is obsessing over attribution. So like, where am I spending money and where am I getting it? Like, if I run Facebook ads, is are they profitable or are they not? Um, every, every, every channel is claiming the wrong amount of revenue, uh, and attribution models are incredibly complex. Like Avinash Kaushik from Google has written extensively on attribution in, in digital and how it's next to impossible. And like, I looked at that as just a strong signal that I shouldn't even try. Like if he, he's like the head brain of analytics at Google and he, he doesn't like it. So what am I going to do? Uh, so I, I, uh, I sort of look at, we look at our total marketing spend as a percentage of revenue and, and if it's going up and it stays within a certain ratio, I don't really fret over which channel is taking claim, you know? Um, and then if I have to, I will like, if I really want to test to see the impact of like, you know, uh, YouTube ads, I'll just shut them off for a day or two and watch what happens. Right. Like, you know, and that's. But that, that only gives you like a, a little time window too. So I think the biggest mistake is definitely obsessing over attribution. That is a, that's a, that's a mess. Yeah. Matt, first of all, thank you. This is, if people haven't been taking notes fast enough, like me, I don't know if you can see this. This is like, uh, <laughs> um, then this has been truly amazing. I have uh, two last questions, but um, Shoot. I want people to check out, they should check out if we haven't talked about it. Uh, pelacase.com, P-E-L-A-C-A-S-E, case.com, to check out the um, fully compostable cell phone cases in iPhone, uh, iPhone, Android, and check out their mission. Uh, you guys are doing amazing stuff with that. And you can check out dmacmedia.com if you do have an e-commerce brand and you know you need to get to the next level with what the services they have. Check them out, obviously. Uh, if you've listened to any of this, 
Uh, Matt knows what he's doing. <laughs> the team knows what they're doing. Um, sure. It's D E M A C Media dot com. And um, so, Matt, I always like to ask, um, since it's Inspired Insider, what has been the uh, lowest moment um, that you had to push through? And on the flip side, what's been a proud milestone that you were able to hit? Because that's why I loved you talking about the tooling and that stuff. Because people see, oh, you make a whatever it is, people make a million dollars or whatever amount they make, 10 million or 20, and they don't realize you had to, they had to actually build out the supply chain. You had to get them at source of materials. The guy probably spent like five, six years trying to develop the product. Yep. And then they have to pay 10,000 per the tooling, ship it over from China, put it into, you know, there's all these pieces that get put into actually, then you get a product and then you can actually, then you have to, to educate and talk about the mission and then yep. someone buys the product. All this yep. stuff happens, it's like the iceberg, right? There's this yeah, little okay. tip you see above and then there's this huge mammoth iceberg underneath that actually, you only see the tip though. So thanks for sharing all those those steps and those details. Yeah, you know? yeah, I think, um, so just to answer, like to the, there hasn't been a whole lot of like what I would call truly low moments. Right. There's there's so many bumps in the road, though. Yeah. That I think for me, that's that's the frustrating part is like every day you're going to take at least one punch. <laughs> right. You know, uh, they, they tend to I, I think that that's I just don't analogy. I just don't I don't <laughs> I just, I don't just picture you like a out. black eye every day. Just yeah, that's it. Man. You're just gonna take a punch, you know, and it's like I. I the things that I, I just I don't like losing people like when they leave whether it's for good reasons or bad I hate it when people leave um, I feel like I've let them down um, but that I also know that that's just part of life maybe talk I, about that for a second because that yeah. that is a theme in what you do which is people right building a team mm-hmm. and people and and you've had I know um, I when I did my research there's people who like some of the first ten or twelve people in DMAC are still with the company, you know, yeah. years later, decade later, or whatever it is. So, talk about maybe uh, a low moment there, but like a retention. How do you, you what things do you do to build a culture in, in so people want to actually stay and be there? Yeah, I, I talked a lot about that. I saw so on actually on Jason Gaynor's podcast in the first season, I talked with Tony uh, Guerrero yeah. from uh, yeah. about culture, right? I and listened to it, it's a good one, yeah. It's it, it's um. Culture is a hard thing to define, and it's a hard thing to build, and it it definitely starts top down, and it starts with like core cultural pillar people, and and over the years we've had like original folks stick around for a long time, and then we've had them leave too. Um, and, and I mean, like Jesus, if I can get more than five years out of any one person, I would consider that a success. And and I say that just simply as like people want to learn more and do more and spread and spread out and try different things, and especially engineers right that constantly want new challenges like if they're good they're sharpening the axe all the time um so i think we've done a good job of of making it interesting and keeping it interesting at different points throughout dmax life cycle and then yeah what's you know, something you was, learned i guess like so let's like, say someone yeah. left like a low moment they left and you learned yep. oh we need to incorporate this now into oh yeah i mean like we've had people leave because we weren't providing enough training and support right like and then so that was years ago and then we sort of created an education budget that people could grab and and use ad hoc like there's like 60 grand a year that we allocate to that so people can grab up to two thousand dollars at a time first come first serve to go and spend it on a course or a class or something it doesn't even have to be related to what we do just like use it to get better um it's like continuous learning and development is something that like i believe in um you know we want to we want to encourage that and you know you think like those lessons from DMAC. So DMAC was a team built around like having fun and building cool shit, right? That was the that was the original thing. Like I started the company because I wanted to have fun and build cool shit. That was it. Like that's the engineer in me. It's what I like to do. Pila is built around a very different culture. Pila is we are committed to a waste free future. So when you think of the people we're recruiting now, that's the core thing that we're galvanizing around. Um, you know, it's everyday products without everyday waste. So I think it's going to create a very different culture, which ultimately is why we separated the two. Like it's a big reason why we separated the two companies is culturally they're going to be different. You know, Pila is going to look like Patagonia, man. People are going to bleed this company 
because they believe in the mission. Yeah. Right. Um, same roles. Like I bet you that the team structure and the roles don't yeah. look all that dissimilar, but they're there for a different reason. And I think like leaders need to recognize why your people are where they are. Um, and that's why I'm okay with people leaving because like life changes too, right? Like we've had people, we've had like really great people, even recently really great people leave because they're just moving for their family. Like they're, they're going to like buy a house far away and they just, it's for personal reasons. I, I don't like it, the leaving, but fuck man, you can't knock that. That's, right. that's good. You know, good for you for taking care of you. Yeah. What about on the flip side? Uh, Proud moment, milestone. Oh, I got a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when I first met Jeremy, the founder for Pila, you know, his, his like, look, my, his dream at the time was he used to let a job. He's like, I'd love to just be employed by Pila, right? I'm like, I will do that. Like, I will make sure this company gets big enough that you can do that. And uh, he started full time in January, left his job, right? First time in seven years of him hacking on wow, that product. really? He's, he's like, yeah, he's like, this is fucking awesome because mm. we built a business that can support him and his family and like that's, that's – I huge. always love hearing that. Yeah. That's huge. I yeah. thought you were going to say working with your wife, but I won't tell you didn't say that. No. I no, I'm like, kidding. <laughs> what, yeah, no, what, what have you learned her. from working with your spouse? Because you guys started DMAC. Yeah, we worked together for six years and then retired her is what we call it. <laughs> we retired her. Uh, the business was getting bigger and she didn't like, she was, she didn't sign up for that, but we always talked about it. She's like, I don't want it to get any bigger than a certain size. And, um, we also wanted to start having kids. So like that was right around the time that we got pregnant with Olive, who's our daughter. And, um, yeah, it was just perfect timing. So it transitioned her out. We actually worked really well together because, well, we didn't work together. <laughs> uh, that's, that's why we worked well together. She was very creative and I was uh, you know, sales and engineering and, um, like nice clean lines, right. Between the two roles. So, uh, we didn't cross paths a whole lot, Got which it. I think our marriage was, was good. It's a good, good, healthy thing. Yes. Um, Matt, thank you. This has been yeah, fantastic. Dude. Everyone should check out pilacase.com, dmacmedia.com. And I just wanted the first one to say, I really appreciate it. So. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and uh, I've actually got it. If they actually want to reach out to me, it's uh, mattbertulli.com. Okay, mattbertulli.com. Yeah. There's like LinkedIn, Twitter, Medium. Where all can they bullshit. find um, – obviously, they can find the cases on your website. They can find yeah. them on Amazon too. Yeah. Um, we what just about started you? on Amazon. So oh, really? There. Okay. <laughs> the, your book, Anything, yep. Anywhere, where on can Amazon. they find that? On Amazon. Is it on yeah. Audible? Uh, No. Damn. I never did that. I should have. You still can. I would listen I to I still that. can. I know. I should. I there really a million, should. million things that you have I know, I don't have, you, I have, you know, 20 product launches today. Yeah. So, I've got some other know, things I got to do right yeah. now. <laughs> but uh, thank you. Everyone check it out and uh, see you on the flip side. Yeah, man. Cheers, bud. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire. Came out better on the other side. Like a beach if you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand